Hey everyone, I'm Josh and I'm the Gatherings Director here at The River Church. And thanks for checking out one of our messages today. We would love to get connected with you and your family. And one easy way to do that is to text River Connect one word to 97,000. Or you can visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and some upcoming events. If you'd like to give to The River Church today, you can text the amount you want to give to 84321, or you can visit our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us today, and we hope you enjoy today's message. Well, welcome to the River Church. Glad you're with us today. My name is Josh. I'm the location pastor here at Lake Orion, and I'm just glad that we're here together here in person and online. I'm glad that we can get into the Word together. We can worship together in spirit and in truth. Um, from my understanding, am I correct in saying that this is the opening of bow season today? Is that, oh, yesterday. Sorry, my bad. Um, I, I'm not one to keep up with that. My idea of going outside is hitting a little white golf ball around a golf course. So uh, that's, that's my thing. But if you're hunting today, I hope that your hunt is bountiful. Is that something you say? I don't know. Uh, okay, all right. That is something you say? Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks for that confirmation. Um, so I just... Uh, yeah, good morning. It's beautiful weather, too. It's so thankful. Jeannie and I were over, actually, Jeannie, Sydney, and I were over at Cornerstone from Friday to yesterday over in Grand Rapids. Got to see Kylie. She's our oldest daughter, and she is doing awesome. She is just doing well. Thank you so much for your prayers. Continue for her. She actually got an internship at a church over there and is working in kids ministry as her job. So um, we're so thankful for that and our family and God is using her. So it's cool to be doing what we do on a Sunday morning, knowing she's doing the same thing in Grand Rapids. It's pretty cool. So anyway, that's an update for our family. Enough about us. Um, about Trunk or Treat coming up. Trunk or Treat is coming up. I know Elijah mentioned that, but I want you to know that there are uh, put little postcards like this on at guest services. Let's invite everybody in our neighborhoods. Like seriously, I would encourage you to take at least two of these cards and hand them out, every single person. That means husbands and wives. That's not two per couple. That if you can do the math, two times two is Good job. That's four. All right. Let's take these and let's hand them out. We really want to be able to give out candy, but even more than that, we want to let people know they're loved and we want to let them know they're loved by God. And so we, let's take these and let's hand these out. Let's get our community knowing that the Trunk or Treat is coming. I just wanted to make sure you knew those, that that was available for you in the back. Now, we are getting back into the Sermon on the Mount. Last year at this time, we dug into the Beatitudes, and it still stands out to me as a message series that meant a lot to me. It really meant a lot to me, digging into the Beatitudes and really beginning to understand what Jesus was saying, because you can read over a passage of Scripture for years until you actually dig into it and let the Spirit speak to you in it. And for me last year, I don't know about you, but the Beatitudes was a great, great study. But as we dig into the Sermon on the Mount, I want to encourage you, again, get into the Word. Don't just rely upon a guy standing on a stage to tell you what Jesus says in the Bible. Get into the Bible. We have these devotionals in the back for you to be able to purchase if you want them. They're five bucks. They're not a ton, but you don't even have to purchase these. You can get them online for free. If you download the River Church app, you can, you can do this devotional every single day and the Bible studies every single week, and it's all free in the app online. You can go to our website, theriverchurch.cc, and you can go to the bookstore at the bottom of the page. Same thing. You can download this. You can even get the devotionals emailed to you every single day in your email box if you want to. So we have all those things for you. But here's the thing. Get into the word. I don't know about you, but when I start doing a devotional, I'm like, oh, okay, so this person said all this stuff about this thing. And some of these devotionals, I mean, all of them have scripture in here, but are we reading it or are we just passing over the scripture to get to the stuff that the person said? I don't know about you, but sometimes I find myself doing that. I'm like, oh, I read that scripture before. Get into the word. Don't, get, don't, get it, don't just get into what somebody says about the word. Get into the word. I don't want to encourage you in that. Matthew's, Matthew, Matthew's, there's only one Matthew. Matthew chapter 5 to 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to be going through more of the Sermon on the Mount through these next, uh, through Thanksgiving, actually, through Christmas season. So get into the word during this time. All right, I can't encourage you to do that enough. So... Grab one of these. If you have any questions, see guest services in the back, and they'll be able to help you find it online or um, be able to get you one of these books for five bucks too, okay? So I don't want to make sure you're aware of that. So this passage of scripture, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5 today, so let's go ahead and turn there. Matthew chapter 5. Um, 
This is the longest recorded message that Jesus taught during his lifetime. And like I said, it's in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And it covers so many different topics. It covers a ton of topics. And honestly, one of the biggest issues that the church faces today is who we live for and who we really represent. Because are we living for ourselves or are we living for Jesus? If we represent him, how should we live that out? What does it look like to be a Jesus follower today? Well, let me encourage you. It doesn't look any different today than it did when Jesus spoke these words 2,000 years ago. It looks the same 2,000 years ago as it does today. And Jesus answered these questions in the Sermon on the Mount. He's preaching to the crowd that's in front of you, but I want to tell you this morning that Jesus is also preaching to us. He's preaching to us where we sit. He's preaching to us in our lives as we live today. It's what a Jesus follower looks like. He starts with that in the Beatitudes. And we are returning to the Sermon on the Mount for the next few weeks. And um, I wanted to start back off with the Beatitudes, though, because it's been a year since we've dug in. And so we're going to start in the first... 12 verses. That's going to be the first half of the message today, and then we're going to dig in the first part of the rest of the Sermon on the Mount this morning as well, all right? So we're going to start off with the Beatitudes. And so if you look at verses 2 through 11, really, what's the first word we see in just about every one of those verses? Blessed or blessed. Don't you know if you're in church and it's a religious thing, you say blessed. I'm kidding. (laughs) It's blessed too. But the reality is, is that that word is right there, blessed, at the beginning of every single verse. What does it mean to be blessed? I mean, come around, you can say up here and say, oh, you know what? I just pray God blesses you. But then you go down to the south and somebody says, oh, bless her heart. What does that really mean? (laughs) What does that really mean? (laughs) <laughs> That's something altogether different, right? So what does the word blessed actually mean here? We talked about this last fall, but again, I think it's important that we start here because everything Jesus is about to say comes from what he said at the beginning of this message. All right? Again, let me go back to Bible Study 101. We are starting a second series on the Sermon on the Mount, right? The reason why we go back to what we're doing is because we have to know the context, We can't get it if we don't start there. And so as you're reading the Bible and you picked out, and you you maybe pick out this verse that we're reading for today, it's not going to be on the screen, but if you picked out verse 13 and just read it, you don't have all the information if you don't read what Jesus already said. So again, back to when you're looking at God's word, we have to know the context. It'd be like coming halfway through the message that I'm speaking and I say something and you take it totally out of context and you can make it mean whatever you want. We have to know what Jesus said here. All right, so that's why we're digging in this morning. So when we think of the word blessed or blessed, we think of good things typically because we don't live in the South, all right? Um, We think that God has given us something we want. Oftentimes, I feel so blessed, you know? And when we think that, it's about what God has given us, right? It's not necessarily about a state of being. And that's not a bad definition, but it's not all That's true of the word blessed. And the word here can actually be translated as happy. Happy are the poor in spirit. Happy are those who mourn. That's also a a, a decent translation. But the word here has a deeper connotation of being approved. Being approved by God. So approved is the person that is poor in spirit. Approved is the person that mourns. Being approved by God. And as we talked last fall, and I still think about it, How many days or how many ways do you look for blessing or happiness, approval, or acceptance in your life? How do you look or where do you find your blessing in life? Where does that come from? And what does the world have to say about these things? How does the world define what it is to be blessed? Usually success, money, relationships, Possessions, strong career, a nice house, a nice car. You know, that, I mean, that, that's typically how the world's going to define being blessed. But the first thing Jesus is telling us is that where you think you obtain happiness or approval is not where you should be looking. The truth is the real thing is not what you think it is because it's not lasting. The blessings of the world don't last. It's found somewhere totally different, and that's where the Beatitudes come in, and how to live our lives for God. This is like a 
Jesus telling us, this is what a follower of mine should look like. And this is how you find approval. This is where you find blessing. And they build on each other. So let's start with the first one in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Again, poor in spirit. When do we realize that somebody that's poor is blessed? Seems like nobody that's poor is going to be happy. Yet Jesus is saying that they are the poor in spirit. Not only that, but they have the kingdom of heaven. See, the poor in spirit here are those that, have, that know that they have no hope on their own. Jesus is talking about an individual that knows that they are bankrupt because of their sin. There is no hope on their own. There's no hope of heaven on their own. They have come to know that their only hope is in Jesus. Brendan Manning, or Brennan Manning, who wrote the Ragamuffin Gospel, spent most of his life as a priest before the light of the kingdom dawned on him. He suggested that the poor in spirit are like the survivors of a shipwreck. Out at sea, all the things they used to rely on, past achievements, accumulated treasures, titles, and degrees, they don't matter. When you're out at sea, that doesn't matter anymore. All that matters now is the plank to which they cling. Manning writes, the shipwrecked have stood at the still point of a turning world and discovered that the human heart is made for Jesus Christ and cannot really be content with less. They cannot take seriously the demands that the world makes on them because we are made for Christ and nothing less will ever satisfy us. The shipwrecked have little in common with the landlocked. The landlocked have their own security system, a home base, credentials and credit cards, storehouses and barns, and their self-interest and investments intact. They never find themselves because they never really feel themselves lost. The shipwrecked, on the contrary, reach out for the passing plank with the desperation of the drowning. Adrift on an angry sea in a state of utter helplessness and vulnerability, the shipwrecked never asked what they could do to merit the plank and inherit the kingdom of dry land. They knew that there was absolutely nothing that any of them could do. See, those that are poor in spirit are those that cling to Jesus because that he, they know that he alone is the way, he alone is the truth, he alone is the life, and he alone is our hope. And yet, how many of us cling to so many other things in life and we're not clinging to Jesus like a person who's shipwrecked? That's what the poor in spirit is about. That's why the blessed are the poor in spirit because they know they have no hope apart from Jesus. They know they've been shipwrecked. And then it takes us to the next one in, in, in verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. See, the poor in spirit, because of who they are and what they have, when they realize that they don't have anything and they realize what they've done in their sin, they will mourn over that sin. He's saying that in the same vein, they know they have no hope in them themselves, and they also know they bring nothing to the table, and so they mourn over the sins they've committed. They, commit, they mourn over their sin. They mourn over others' sin. This is a spiritual mourning. This isn't a mourning of like they've lost something or someone. It's the reality that I've done wrong and so I now mourn over that because you poor in spirit. You know you don't have any hope and so you come to this. The goal of the world though is not to be poor in spirit. It's not to mourn. The whole point is to be happy. Drown your sorrows. Use things to anesthetize yourself. Be entertained so you don't think about the things that are going on in your life. Think about other things and just act like it's not there. That's how most of the world deals with this. Jesus says, become poor in spirit and mourn. Because we don't find our hope in things, we find our hope in Jesus. Jesus comes and says that the person that's truly happy, that's approved by God, is the person that mourns. The person that will really, really truly take a look at who they are and what they've done. But also what Jesus has done. And you mourn. And when you mourn that way, Jesus says you'll be comforted because you're loved and because you found your hope in him. And that leads us to verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Meekness is not weakness. It's fully compatible with strength, even great strength. The person that's poor in spirit understands that apart from God, they have no hope, that they are given the kingdom of heaven. That person, they understand how deep they've sinned. They mourn over it. But now they're meek because they understand that, look, I know where I am. I know who I am. I know what I've done. And so now I'm meek. It's not that you're not strong. It's that you get it. Who am I now? 
Who am I to put myself out there and act like I'm something big? I'm not big. Jesus is big. That's what a meek person does. They make more of Jesus than their own name. And there's strength there. It doesn't mean you're weak. It doesn't mean you turn away from hard things and you're lazy. It doesn't mean that you're just a nice person or you're easy to get along with. It doesn't mean you placate people. It's not a weakness of personality or character. Because when meekness comes, you develop a deep trust in God. A deep trust. That person is happy, and they know that apart from God, they don't have anything. See, harshness in your life, harshness in your life is gone when you're meek. Because you don't go after anybody anymore. Grasping for whatever you want, and what you want to achieve is given to God, and there's a reliance on him. When someone comes at you, denigrates you, makes fun of you, puts you down, ridicules you, you're not defensive and you don't try to get back at the other person because I know who I am and I'm about Jesus and it's about him and I don't want to push anybody away. And then the meek inherit the earth. The meek are Jesus' followers. These are the people that follow Jesus. We're meek. Then the person that's meek, well, that's next. Verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. This hunger and thirst is a deep longing. I'm not sure how many of us have ever been really, 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 really hungry or thirsty. Right? When I was a youth pastor many moons ago, we used to do this thing called the 30-hour famine. And we literally wouldn't eat for 30 hours to identify with the kids that we were raising money for that lived in hunger and poverty all the time. And so we'd, we'd have the students stop eating, and all the adults would stop eating at noon on Friday, and we didn't eat again until 6 p.m. on Saturday. All we had was water. And we would do stuff. We would go to service projects, and we, would, we slept up on the hill acting like we were homeless people. We slept in boxes. And we tried to figure out what it felt like to be able to, I mean, as best we could. Um, one year we went and cleaned up a crack house in Detroit while we're not eating. Let me tell you, when you're not eating for a while, it gets pretty intense. And we always broke our fast at 6 p.m. with a bunch of soup. That was the best soup we ever had. It may not have been, but it sure tasted that way that night. When you hunger and thirst for something, you long for it. The righteousness of God. You long, hunger, and thirst for righteousness. Because you're meek, you already know who you are. You know who Jesus is. And you want him more than anything. Because the righteousness that's given to us by God is the only righteousness that matters. We have no righteousness in ourselves. We've realized that because we're poor in spirit. We've mourned over it. We're meek, right? And now we're coming to desiring the righteousness from God. And you know what this, What does the verse say? What's the promise? When we hunger and thirst after God's righteousness, what happens? We're satisfied. Man, how often, uh, ask yourself that question. How often are you satisfied? That's a hard question because I'm not often. I always want more of whatever it is. Good, bad, otherwise. It's like we always want more. We're not satisfied. But here it says when we hunger after the uh, the righteousness of God, we're going to be satisfied in that. The more you put God's will before before your own, the more fulfilled you will become. It's a weird thing, but it's true. And then once you hunger and thirst for righteousness, guess what happens in your life? Number seven, or verse seven, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Why is mercy so hard to give to other people? Why is mercy so hard to give to other people when we so desperately want it ourselves? We so desperately need mercy. And and what is mercy? We often describe it in relation to grace. So grace is getting what you don't deserve, and mercy is not getting what you do deserve. When people cry out for mercy, they're begging that their punishment doesn't fall on them. But it is a little bit more, because Jesus is talking about action here. It's not just about forgiveness, though it includes forgiveness. Because when you show grace, you're focusing on forgiving the sin. When you show mercy, you actually have pity on the person in the state of sin. You actually care about the person who's struggling in that sin. It does away with the offense, and you hurt for the other person because they're separated from God. And you want to alleviate that pain 
and that separation. That's real mercy. Mercy isn't just forgiving someone. It's feeling sorry for them in their state and wanting to see them reconciled to God. That's difficult when somebody's hurt you deeply. But again, think of the progression. We have to go back and realize that we were poor in spirit. We have to realize that we mourn over our sin and recognize who we are. Then we're meek because it puts us in right standing before God in our heads. We're already there because of Jesus, but we now know who we are. And now we're hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And then all of a sudden, now we're a person who shows mercy. And what happens to the person that shows mercy? You're shown mercy. Think about it. If you walk around holding things over people all the time, how are you going to be treated? You're going to have things held over you all the time, aren't you? If you show mercy to everybody, what's the chances that other people are going to show you mercy as well? A lot greater. It doesn't mean that you're not going to get smacked sometimes when you show mercy to people. And that's when it really gets hard. But think about how many times Jesus showed mercy and he was smacked pretty heavily. We can't expect less as we follow a risen Savior, a crucified and risen Savior. So we show mercy. And then we come to verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And we think of purity and we're like, okay, we're, we're pure. We're, we're, now we're hungry and thirsting after righteousness. We're showing mercy, so we're not as bad as we used to be. Uh, that might be part of it, but I think what Jesus, in fact, what Jesus is not, I think, but what Jesus is saying here is that he's talking about a oneness of heart. A heart that is committed to him. A laser focus of being pure in heart. It's seeing, of, you get to see God now and in, and in the future. It's our hope for today and for tomorrow. There's going to be times when you were blind and all of a sudden you can see. It, it's an amazing thing is in this adventure of following Jesus Christ. Is when you have that faith and then all of a sudden you can see. Let me also say, just as a side note, I mentioned the word faith. I do not believe ever that it is faith over fear. I believe it's faith in the midst of fear. We are all afraid at times. And I think of thinking that we hate it. If we're afraid that we don't have faith, no way. It's faith in the midst of it. Why do you think Jesus said so many times, or the God said, Jesus too, don't be afraid. Angels all over the place, don't be afraid. He knew we'd be afraid. It's faith in the midst of fear. So you may be even afraid in the middle of being pure in heart and having that laser focus. But we come back, and what happens when we have that kind of, that kind of focus, that kind of purity of heart? You're going to see God. But let me propose to you something that's unique about this, because it's like we have, we have this saying that, man, it's just so great when God shows up. How many of you heard that? Most of us have heard that. Some of us have said it, right? Let me remind you of something. God never shows up. He's always there. See, it's in the moments where we are pure at heart. It's the moments where we have that focus on God where we actually turn our eyes toward heaven. And that's when we get to see God work. He's been working. He's always working. We sing about it. But it's when we focus on him, all of a sudden, our eyes are opened and we see what God's doing. And we have faith in the midst of whatever we're going through in the meantime. Then there's peacemakers. We talked about peace last week or the week before. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And so this idea is, not, peace is not just being, you know, having a nice relationship with someone. The idea of peace all throughout scripture is the Hebrew word shalom. And shalom is peace, but so much more. It's completeness, it's wholeness, it's the way things were supposed to be. That's wholeness. And that's what happens when Shalom comes, not only for the individual person, but for those around them and even extending into the community and into the world. And what does a peacemaker do? Remember, we talked about that bond of peace. We have to what? We have to fight for it. Notice this isn't a peace doer, a peaceful person. It is a peace, what? Maker. It means you pursue it. You make 
peace. You go after peace. You seek peace in your relationships. But again, why? I'm poor in spirit because I know I have no hope other than God. I've mourned over my sin. I know what I've done. And I'm meek now because I know who I am before God. Why would I go after someone? And then I'm hungering and thirsting after righteousness and I offer mercy and I'm pure in heart. So being a peacemaker is the next step. It makes sense. I'm going after peace with people in the community. I want to see people made whole, not through the devices of the world, but through Jesus Christ, our Savior. That's what a peacemaker does. And so we go through this process and we live this way and then Jesus has to remind us in verses 11 and, oh, sorry, 10, 11, and 12. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and other all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We can read this sometimes and go, man, I feel so persecuted. There's so many times when we post something on social media and we get blasted for it. See, I'm being persecuted for Jesus' sake. Are you really? Or are you being persecuted because you were a jerk? Let's be honest. Because when we follow this progression, are we going to be a jerk if we've become poor in spirit? If we'd be mourned over our sin, if we are, I got to go back to the list. Or if, we, if, we, if we turn meek, if we're now meek, if we hunger and thirst for righteousness, if we are merciful, if we're pure in heart, if we want to make peace. How many of us in our social media posts, when we want to make a point, are trying to make peace? Really? Are we? Remember, we're supposed to be slow to speak quick to listen, and slow to become angry. But for some reason on social media, it's a cesspool, and we blow people up because of political positions. And I keep saying social media because I keep seeing Christians posting junk on social media that's doing nothing of what the Beatitudes have to say. We would never say these things in person. But some of these conversations we have that are more about our government and where it's at. My friends, do we live in this kingdom? Are we supposed to live for this kingdom? No, we live in it. We're not of it. We're here to impact it. We're here to impact this kingdom. And when we don't, and we're persecuted for Jesus' sake, for Jesus' sake, for living like a person that Jesus described in the Beatitudes, because here's what happens. When we live this way, what happens in our communities? We're going to learn about that in a minute. When we live this way, is that going to be fun for people? Not really. Not really. I can't tell you, again, I go on the golf course and I'll golf with somebody that I don't know and they're dropping F-bombs and all kinds of stuff throughout the round. I, I'm like, don't ask me what I do. Don't ask me what I do. Don't ask me what I do. We just play golf, you know. And then about the 10th or 11th hole, hey, what do you do for a living? Oh, boy. <laughs> I'm a pastor. <laughs> and then they can't hit the ball the rest of the round. It's like because they're all worried about it, right? But I will say the way I was, the way I was in, 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 in the legalistic tradition in which I was raised, as soon as somebody cursed, you called them on it. Oh, that's how you called them on it. Oh. Like literally, that was the reaction. That was what I was taught. That's getting persecuted for being a jerk. We're here to be a peacemaker. We're here to love people. But when we live this way and we, don't, we just don't talk that way, people notice something different. You know? I also remember working at Wells Fargo Bank when I was in college. And everybody talked about their stuff. And I, I mean, I, I let them talk. And I, and I talked about my life and whatnot. And they knew what, where I was going to school and what I wanted to do. But I didn't call people on anything. It wasn't my place. But the cool thing was is as I just lived my life, Again, not perfect. I'm not trying to say that I was awesome. I'm not the hero of the story. Jesus is. 
But the reality is that sometimes at break, people would come to me and go, man, things aren't great in my marriage. What, what do you think? I'd be able to have some questions asked from time to time. It wasn't all the time. And then every once in a while they'd say, he's our resident theologian. You know, I was in like 20, 19, 20 years old working at a bank, you know. But it was this back and forth that was good. It wasn't negative. And yet there's other times you're at work and maybe you're asked to do something you shouldn't do and you decide to live this way and maybe your job is in danger. That's being persecuted for Jesus' sake. Right? We do what's right because it's right, not because it always feels good. And so Jesus is telling us this is how we live. And it's the backdrop of everything else that we're about to see. And so this, the, the second part of the message this morning, what we're going to land on is verse 13. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. So my friends, it's time to be salty. Right? But when we hear that, that's another thing. Salty? That means you're a jerk, right? <laughs> you got a little attitude going on that day. Man, they're salty. But it's time to be salty in the world. Jesus says to be the salt of the earth. What is Jesus saying here? Why would Jesus bring salt into the picture of how we live for him? The easy thing is to look at this and go, oh, well, how do I use salt? Well, it's in a shaker on my table, and I put it on food to season things. Oh, Jesus wants us to, to season others with him, and we're called to sprinkle Jesus everywhere, and so we walk around sprinkling everywhere. No, not that. Not that way. Shaker. You, you know what I mean. A little Jesus here, a little Jesus there. And I'm living how Jesus told me to. That's being the salt of the earth, right? And if that's where we stop, sure, maybe a little bit of what it is. But that's not really where he's at. In order to understand what Jesus is saying, we have to understand the function of salt in the days Jesus lived. The primary function of salt in that day was the preservation of food. Because they didn't have any ice makers, they didn't have any refrigerators, those were going to happen centuries later. Nobody had any idea. Meat had to be eaten right away or it had to be preserved. And the only way to preserve meat was to salt it down heavily or to put it into a salt solution. It was a common practice all the way up to the 20th century, really, to, pre to preserve food. This is a quote from some pioneer missionaries that how they were preserving their food. And they said, it was said, this is what was written. This was absolutely imperative. Under the high temperatures and hot weather of the region, decay and, comp and decomposition of meat was astonishingly, astonishingly rapid. We had no winter weather or cool, sounds like California, frosty nights to, ch or frosty nights to chill the flesh. Besides this, swarms of ubiquitous flies soon hovered over the butchered carcasses. The only way to prevent them from ruining the meat was to soak the slabs of meat in a strong solution of salt. See, the understanding that the use of salt in Jesus' day was all about preservation is imperative to understanding what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying by calling us a salt of the earth that the world around us is decaying and rotting away. The world around us is decaying and rotting away. It's the natural tendency of the state of the world without Jesus. That's just the truth. But is this a surprise to any of us? Like, really? When we look around the world today, do we, do we see it getting better? Or is it, is it decaying? In reality, when we look at God's word and we compare the world with what's happening, we see decay happening. We see it declining. We see people going at each other. We see evil being called good all the time. I'm not going to go into specifics today. We all know what's going on in the world around us. Kent Hughes says this, the commentator. Jesus was saying, in effect, humanity without me is a dead body that is rotting and falling apart. And you, my followers, are the salt that must be rubbed into the flesh to halt the decomposition. What a picture. 
right? That sounds fun. But I mean, us being the salt of the world, when we're living as Jesus just described in the Beatitudes, we're called to be rubbed into the world so that we preserve it. Why? To hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the purpose and the plan. So if we live as Jesus indicated in the Beatitudes, what happens in our neighborhoods? Think about that. If you actually go and live that in your neighborhood, what happens? There's a good possibility people come to Jesus. At minimum, you're going to have good relationships with your neighbors and possibly be a peacemaking force. So when the neighbors across the street are mad at each other because of some kind of tree, maybe you can help them figure it out because you're a third party. Or their fence was built too high. You know, that kind of stuff. As you meet people, they recognize something's different. As you have people in your home because you want people to see, you want to love people. That's how it goes. When you become a Jesus follower, you invite people over because you just want to know them, not because they're a project, because God loves them and so do you. How does that change your neighborhood? You start organizing block parties for your neighborhood. I know some of you introverts are going, oh my gosh, but how do I do that? Okay, one person at a time. One person at a time. I'm speaking as an extrovert, right? So as an introvert, one person at a time. Have more for coffee. You know? What does that do in our community? If we as a church really begin to live out the Beatitudes, if we seek to make peace, if we become meek, if we're humble, what does that look like? It changes things. What does that do in our workplaces? One person can change the destination of a place, of a workplace. See, being the salt of the earth actually holds back some of the evil that we can see in our communities when we live as somebody who is really a Jesus follower. But he takes it a step further and he says, what happens to this salt when it loses its saltiness? He says that, it, how shall its saltiness, if it has no taste, how can it, how can it be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. <coughs> and so what has happened in large degree is we've let the world dilute our saltiness. We've become less seasoned as we allow the world into our lives, as we seek after what the world has to offer and not what Jesus has to offer. The effect of preservation begins to fade and more souls don't see Jesus. And here's the thing, if you lose your saltiness, it can be difficult to address because ultimately it's sin that causes us to lose our saltiness. But we serve a God who brings restoration, don't we? We serve a God who brings forgiveness and mercy and healing. And as we recognize those things, what happens to us again? We become poor in spirit again. We can go back to the beginning of the process. And Jesus can restore our saltiness. And so when we point our lives back at him, we can regain that. But have you lost your saltiness this morning? Have you lost your pugnancy in other people's lives? Not, again, not being a jerk about it, but because of who Jesus has made and is making you. See, we're here to point people to Jesus, nothing else. That is our purpose for being here as followers of Jesus Christ. It's our call, not to any other name, not to any other help, not to any other hope, because every other hope will not satisfy. It will bring disappointment. There's only one hope that satisfies, and it's found in Jesus Christ. But we have to ask ourselves the question, do we actually believe that? See, I would say that's also where we lose our saltiness. It's because when we've been in church a while or we've been sitting in a chair, used to be a pew, almost said pew. Some of you have been like, what in the world is that? Um, but when, when we've been in church a while, we begin to just think it's old hat. And we believe it. Sure, we believe it. Yeah, we believe it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, you're not, but then we don't live for Jesus every day. We live for our jobs. We live for our money. We live for our stuff. We live for our family. You, live in the, you put in the blank. 
Living for our family is not wrong, but if our family is over God, our family has become an idol. We're here for Jesus, and we lose our saltiness if we don't actually believe that he is the, he is the hope of the world. My friends, we are, we are to offer hope where there is none, to offer the rock of salvation where there is despair, to point to a peace that passes all understanding when everything around you is shaken. We point to a peace that passes all understanding and it's found in Jesus. I have this poster on my wall in my office and I look at it often and it's called the five solas. The five solas, they're all written in Latin. The first one is sola fide, means by faith alone. The next one is sola scriptura, through, the, through God's word alone. Sola Christus, through Christ alone. Sola gratia, through grace alone. And soli Deo gloria, to God's glory alone. I think that sums up the Beatitudes. It's by faith alone, through God's word alone, through Christ alone, through grace alone, and for God's glory alone. That's how we're salty. That's how we're the salt of the earth. By recognizing that it's him, it's all about him. Without him, we have no hope. Without him, we have no help. Without him, we have no peace. So I want us to really answer this question this morning. And if you think about anything, think about this as you leave. How are you salt in the lives of those around you? How are you salt in the lives of those around you? Are you salty? Are you salty with the gospel of Jesus? Salty with the beatitudes lived out in your life? Because my friend, Jesus has called you. If you know him as Savior, he has called you out of the miry pit. Why do we go back to the stuff that never satisfies? And every single one of us does it. We've come to Jesus to drink from the well of living water, and then we go to this decaying carcass and keep eating at it. Because we think somehow Jesus has given me enough hope and I want this over. Jesus is the hope, not this stuff over here. But the cool thing about this is that he believes you can be the salt of the earth. Jesus called you the salt of the earth. He called me the salt of the earth. He believes that you can do it through him and through the spirit of God. You have been called to do that. So, get out of the salt shaker. Get out of the salt shaker. Get rubbed into people's lives. This isn't something that's easy. It might even be hard. Think about it. If you're, if salt, how would salt, how, what would salt say as they're getting rubbed into this meat? Probably not the best thing in the world. And yet, God has called us to get into people's lives and to love well. To go through muck, to go through pain, to carry other people's sorrows, and to still love. And when you get a chance to do that, what an honor that God would ask you to be a part of that. God has a call for every single one of us to be the salt of the earth. How salty are you? View it as a challenge, but view it as an honor that God would want to use you in that way. Point your life at Jesus. Get rubbed into the wounded that are likely around you. And God will show you what to do. You're not always going to know what to say. You're not going to always know what to do. But God's spirit will show up at the right time every time. As you are poor in spirit. As you 
have mourned over your sin. As you are meek. As you hunger and thirst after righteousness. As you show mercy. And as you make peace. How salty are you today? How salty are you? There's something you need to put aside this morning and the Spirit is t- telling you that, that, I mean, you gotta put this aside in order to be more salty. Then I say, throw it aside. Lay off the chains that encumber us. That's Hebrews chapter 12. We throw off any encumberment that is on us and we set our eyes toward the goal. We set our eyes on the one who saved us. So let's do that together. Man, lay it down. If you need help laying it down, it's why we have growth communities. Throw that plug in there again. Growth communities are amazing. We have each other. It's an amazing thing to be a part of. You're not alone in this. We are the salt of the earth. Let's be salty. Let's have the worship you come up. Let me pray for us. God, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for how you have ministered to us, God, how you love us. God, for all the things that you do, for all the things that you are, Lord, I just pray that you would help us to be more salty than we have been, to um, desire you more than anything else. God, I pray that you would bring people into our lives that need your love, that need some salt. That God, we might be Salty with Christ everywhere we go and carry your name well. For those of us that are struggling with being salty because we're carrying burdens, Lord, I pray that we would recognize where we are maybe in the Beatitudes, Lord, and that, Lord, if we need mercy, I pray that we would seek it from you and we would in turn show it to others. Lord, if we need peace, that we come to you and find that peace and offer it to those around us. God, if there's anybody here that doesn't know you this morning as Lord and Savior, I pray that they will have heard how awesome you are and that you have forgiven us of our sin. If we would come before you and, 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 and confess our sins to you, you will forgive us. If we just come to the cross, believe who you say you are, that you're the son of God and that you did what you said you did, that you died and you rose from the dead on the third day and we call on your name and ask for forgiveness, you tell us you will save us, God. And so if there's anybody here this morning that doesn't yet know you, I pray that your spirit will work in their hearts. God, we love you. Thank you for your word. Make us salty for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.